the vampire is one of the staples of the horror genre. Since its earliest days in folklore, it has been able to inspire fear of the dark. For who knows what lurks within the night. The vampire has been portrayed on the big screen by such greats as Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee. And sure, in recent years, the vampire's reputation has been tarnished by certain sparkly stalkers, but these sparkly stalkers are very few and far between. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be taking a look at a game that keeps with the tradition of the vampire as a fearsome creature of the night. Today, we are taking a look at Nosferatu, the Wrath of Malashi. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Nosferatu, The Wrath of Mariachi is one of those games that used to be sold a lot in half-price books. They'd usually put it near the register in the vain hope that someone would finally pick it up and take it home. As for me, I looked at it quite a bit. I used to pick it up and look at the screenshots on the back of the box and see that you could use a revolver, but sadly, being able to use a revolver was not enough enticement for me to finally pick up the game. But a few months back, I finally did pick up the game on GOG, and I finally gave it its due. So with that, let's jump right in and take a look. Nosferatu, The Wrath of Malashi was developed by Idle FX and released in 2003, and is one of the more unique entries in the survival horror genre. This is a survival horror first-person shooter, and it combines both genres quite well. Its atmosphere is scary and inspires a sense of dread, its enemies are varied and each have differing powers, and some require certain weapons to kill. And the game takes place in a non-linear location, and like any good survival horror game, you have to find a crap ton of keys to access the various areas of the game world. The main objective for Nosferatu is simple. You rescue your family members from their locked rooms before the timer runs out and they die. I am not a fan of games with time limits. In fact, I'd go as far to say that I hate games with time limits. I'm looking at you, Dead Rising 1. I always feel like you never get a chance to just stop and enjoy the game, and you're constantly battling the clock to try to get either A, a good ending, or B, being able to just finish the bloody game. Thankfully, Nosferatu The Wrath of Malachi doesn't actually make you beat the clock. The time limit is fair, and you usually have plenty of time to do everything you need to do. And really, the time limit helps give the game some urgency and serves the overall plot and tone, and does not just feel like annoying, fake difficulty. The game takes place entirely within the Count's castle, and the castle itself is handled in a rather interesting way. It's entirely randomly generated each time you start a new game, meaning that no two castles are entirely alike. Although, the order you want to rescue your family members in is going to stay more or less the same, as each family member provides you with some benefit. For example, you really, really want to rescue both the priest and doctor First, the doctor will heal you for free, and the priest gives you the single best weapon in the game. The castle's layout can be and is confusing. And of course, you don't get a bloody map. But that being said, I was still able to figure out where to go without too much difficulty. Yeah, it is annoying how maze-like this castle is, but it doesn't get annoying enough to make you want to save and exit the game and go play something better. Once you rescue a family member, you have to escort them to an area called the Sanctuary. This is where they will sit around for the entire bloody game, but we'll get back to those lazy blue bloods in a minute. When you rescue a family member, you have to make sure they stay following you because they have very poor AI. They get caught on doors, and sometimes they just stop for some inexplicable reason. Some family members are actually somewhat useful, as they will attack enemies. The brother character and the grandfather character will both beat the crap out of enemies, but most of the others just cower in fear. 
And even though the brother and grandfather character can defend themselves, do they bother helping you? Absolutely not. They just sit around in the sanctuary with all the other family members waiting for you to actually save everyone. Ah, that's nobleman for you. Sitting on their asses while everyone else has to do all the bloody work. Well, I get the feeling those blue bloods are going to get a bit of a wake-up call two years later in 1914. But that aside, one really cool thing is the fact that you play as the character known as James Patterson. In the Medal of Honor series, there's a character known as Jimmy Patterson. So one wonders if James Patterson is Jimmy Patterson's father. Looks like old James decided to immigrate to America to get away from his blue-blooded, lazy-ass family. Lazy asses aside, you have a bunch of cool and unique weapons to fight the legions of the dead with. You have your trusty sword cane, and while that sounds cool in theory, it is good for absolutely nothing. And it is never used in the game if you can help it. Because old James here is a badass. He has fists of both fury and steel, and must have the muscles of the mighty Arnold. Because for the first pitch of the game, your go-to weapon will be the fists. Unlike with the sword cane, the fists can actually stun lock the enemy, and, well, James can really lay the smackdown upside some demon's heads. And the fists don't really stop being a viable weapon until you finally start collecting ammo for some of your smoke poles. And no, this time I am not using that as a euphemism. You get two single-shot black powder guns, a single-shot pistol, and a single-shot musket. And both are absolutely awe-inspirational. Sure, the AK is okay. Yeah, the M1's great and all, but you know what? When it comes to shooting demons, the one gun I've always wanted to use is a single-shot musket. Sure, it's slow to reload, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen? It's a rare treat indeed to be able to fight the hordes of hell with a bloody musket. These guns will wreck just about any non-magical enemy. It is really hilarious when a supposedly scary enemy jumps out at you and you just blow the bastard away and keep moving. Due to the way the game is programmed, you can actually carry several flintlock pistols and muskets at any one time. Meaning you can shoot a bastard and then pull out another pistol and shoot another one like you're a bloody blackbeard. Carrying a couple muskets on your back makes less sense, but is no less fun for it. You then have a revolver, and you get this from rescuing a family member. This is another good weapon to use, primarily on weaker enemies. Then, you have the BFG of the game, the MG0815. Yeah, it's anachronistic since that 15 at the end means it's from 1915, but seeing as how you get it from the grandfather character, I'm willing to give the game the benefit of the doubt and say that it was a one-off gun commissioned for the grandfather character to go on safari with. Overkill. <laughs> There is no such thing as overkill. The OA-15 is some big medicine indeed, and will cure any lion or tiger of what ails it. Overhunting aside, the O815 is the best bullet weapon of the game, and will see you through many enemy encounters late game. Then you got the magic weapons, and both rely on the power of Christ to compel the enemies to stay permanently dead. You have the crucifix, and this is used to re-kill ghost enemies, and it can stun some vampiric enemies. The best weapon in the game is the BFC, or Big Fucking Chalice. You get this weapon when you rescue the priest. There are pools of water throughout the game, and these pools can be turned holy with the crucifix. And then you can fill the chalice with said holy water, and the holy water blesses all with its purity. This one weapon will allow you to kill literally every boss sans one with just a couple of sprinkles. So you can have the mighty great beast vampire. He's growling and looking scary. And yeah, a couple of sprinkles will cure what ails him. This is a survival horror game where the right weapon at the right time makes all the difference. The enemies for the game are fairly standard horror enemies, but they never really get old, as you don't end up facing the same five guys over and over again. We're going to take a look at three of the most common enemies in the game. You have the Peasant. And this particular individual is armed with a variety of weapons, ranging from black powder weaponry to scythes. The scythe peasants are absolutely deadly, and they can kill you in one or two hits. You know, instead of opening up portals to hell, the Count should have just bloody well invested in more scythe-armed peasants. 
Hell, with an army of those guys, he could have conquered the entire Austro-Hungarian Empire. Not that that'd be hard to do anyway. You then have the Hell Dogs. If you get swarmed by these bastards, you can get killed pretty quickly as they can stun lock you. Then there are the Demons. These guys don't do much damage, but they do like to blindside you. If they're using combined arms tactics with the Hell Dogs, they can really kill you fast. Then you have the Ghosts. They don't do much damage to you, and they go down in one hit, but they do force you to switch your weapons, which can give other enemies an opening. Now, let's look at the technical side of things. Graphics are pretty bloody basic. Uh, you could actually say they're pretty bloody crap, even back in 2003, but they serve the purpose of giving you something to look at, and I have definitely seen worse graphics in a game. We are taking a look at the GOG version of Nosferatu The Wrath of Melashi, and it works fairly well. The performance for the game is okay. It doesn't stay at 60 FPS throughout most of the game, but it certainly tries! This, of course, is still a right and proper PC game. Meaning, of course, you can quick save whenever you bloody well feel like. There's not all that much voice acting in the game, and what voice acting is there is passable. Nothing amazing, but it doesn't sound that horrible either. Nosferatu The Wrath of Mariachi is more or less just a gameplay game. You don't really play it for its plot, and really, when you play the game, you're playing it for its gameplay and to see if you can beat your previous time. And really, the plot that is there just boils down to Vampires have kidnapped your family. Are you a bad enough nobleman to rescue your family? But despite this, let's take a look at the plot anyway. As mentioned earlier, you play as James Patterson. You arrive late at the Castle Malashi because he was out getting wasted at the pub. I mean, uh, getting laid at the brothel. I mean, he was leaving a fencing tournament in Sweden. Yeah, that's the one. Totally was not out being a snotty early 20th century nobleman. In any event, booze and boobs aside, James arrives at the castle Malashi late. Gotta keep you that in mind, he got there late. It's totally not, not his fault. You know, I mean, getting drunk, I mean, uh, leaving a Sweden tournament, it's difficult. He gets there at 10.30 at night, specifically. Actually, that does kind of lend credence to the whole boobs boobs theory, but he's there for a wedding, you see. His sister, Rebecca, is marrying the son of the castle's count. And he's only a little bit, just a little bit inbred. More like, you know, backwoods Georgia versus Spanish royal family. And still, your sister can look herself in the mirror and say, at the very least, she didn't marry Conrad von Hotzendorf. When Jimmy arrives, he finds the castle deserted and totally not looking super creepy, and obviously a vampire's lair. James explores a bit, and then the priest character falls out the window and tells you that the Count has locked up your family and they will all be killed if you don't save them in time. He also tells you that you must find the Doctor character, otherwise you will bleed out and die. And thus starts your journey through the Castle of Malachi. The game features several boss fights along the way, each of which are trivial if you have the BFC. What's really funny is the fact that you have to rescue not one, but two male characters from Succubuses. Hey, it's 1912. No internet, no TV, no radio really to speak of. What else are you gonna do to pass the time? As you play the game, you learn from both books scattered around and rescued family members just what is going on. Your sister has been kidnapped by the Count, and at the crack of dawn she will be sacrificed so that the Count can bring Lord Malachi back to life and then conquer the world with his evil hell beasts. I'm a little dubious about the whole world conquering thing. The Count is Transylvanian after all, and that was a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at this time, and we all know how well they did in the war two years later. And that being said, I just shudder to think of how incompetent a vampire Conrad von Hotzendorf would have been. He'd probably send out his vampire troops during the daylight or something. Once you rescue the brother character, you finally get a key that allows you to access the main building of the castle. And you have to rescue your father and potentially one other guy. The game doesn't tell you that you have to rescue the other guy before you rescue your father, because if you rescue your father first, you just leave the guy in there to die. No matter how much time is left, you cannot go back to get him. Ah, you gotta love the loyalty of nobleman. Ah, just leave him, he doesn't matter. But we can go rescue him at any time. Ah, it doesn't matter. Somebody needs to polish my shoes. The end game is pretty damn good. You fight to the top of the castle of Malachi to finally stop the Count from resurrecting the Lord Malachi. 
You fight all the way to the top of the castle, only to find that you are too late to save your sister Rebecca, and the Count sacrifices her and then attacks you. And here is literally what I did to try and kill him. Yep, that's what happened. I thought all I had to do was sprinkle some water on the blood-drinking hell beast and he'd die. Uh, instead, I died hilariously quickly. That goes to show you that sometimes you need something a little bit more than a squirt of holy water. The game never tells you outright how to kill the Count. One would think that you could kill him like any other boss, but nope, it's a boss fight right out of Quake 1. You have to hit a couple of switches and then lure him to the center of the room and boom, one deep fried Count. And then you face the real boss fight of the game, Lord Malashi. He turns into an evil hell beast that looks quite cool, but he's super easy to kill. All you gotta do is shoot him in the big glowy thing and he dies in about 30 seconds. Really, the Count was a more powerful boss because he couldn't be hurt by anything other than sunlight. So why was Lord Malashi made up to be this big super powerful badass when literally all you have to do is shoot him a bunch? It's like saying an M3 half-track is scary compared to a bloody Koenigstiger. In any event, we get a really cool ending where the narrator says you should consider yourself a hero for killing all the forces of evil when your blue blood family just sat around on their fat asses eating foie gras. And we then get to see James proper, and by the great talus does he look cool with all his guns strapped to him. If he were not the father of Jimmy Patterson, perhaps he immigrated to Michigan and was the great grandfather of Ash Williams, as he does have a bit of an Ash Williams vibe. And so that is Nosferatu, The Wrath of Malashi. This is an excellent game all around. Sure, it's not super groundbreaking. Sure, it does not have super amazing photorealistic graphics. Sure, it doesn't have super amazing voice acting. And sure, the story is not novel quality. But it is still a satisfying game from start to finish. As mentioned in previous videos, not all games need to be game of the year all years to be good. And NOS 4A2 is a game that is well worth playing, as it accomplishes everything it sets out to do. It has a great atmosphere, really, really fun gameplay, and while the story is simple, it still serves the purpose of giving the game context. And while the characters are nothing special, you at the very least don't want to see them get killed. Overall, NOS 4A2 is a B, if ever there was one. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is Nosferatu, the Wrath of Malashi. It's definitely one of those forgotten gems, and can be had for very cheap on GOG. And so, I am General Lots, wishing you good Resident Evil Zero, and good Resident Evil, um, seven, or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of Nosferatu the Wrath of Malashi, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you these awesome game reviews.